morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started with the next panel. Uh, my name is Steve Eskenazi, and along with my uh, friend and uh, fellow charter member of Thai, Prashant Shah, uh, we co-chair the uh, entrepreneurship track today, so we hope you enjoy the panels and uh, keynotes and fireside chats that we put together. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the, uh, the next panel for today, entitled, How to Not Mess Up Your Cap Table. Um, I remind you that if you have questions to text capital A2 to the number uh, on the screen in front of you, uh, and that will, you will get prompted to then type in your question, and your question will show up uh, on the tablet today uh, with, uh, with the moderator of the, of the panel, which I'm happy to introduce to you, uh, Aftab Jamil from BDO. Aftab, take it away. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, this panel discussion. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Aftab Jamil. I'm a partner at BDO. Uh, we are the fifth largest uh, international accounting firm. And in addition to my role as a partner, I also head up our firm's technology and life sciences practice. And in that role, I get the wonderful opportunity to meet with uh, very energetic and up-and-coming startup companies and deal with the entrepreneurs on a daily basis. And this topic that we have, uh, uh, I'm glad that Ty actually has selected that topic. Uh, there's a lot of discussion over the years, a lot of panel discussions and seminars that how is it to um, approach the VCs or other investors to get the money, uh, but perhaps not enough has been discussed about this very important topic. And to demystify that topic a little bit, we have a you know, panel of experts you know, for the very simple definition of what is a cap table, this essentially is a detailed breakdown of what are the different types of ownership stakes that a company may offer. What are the current um, owners of that, those ownership stakes, and what are perhaps the future um, rights that you have given uh, to others to buy that. And we're going to try to demystify that a little bit. The, the panelists that we have um, include Naeem, who's been a serial entrepreneur, is a venture capitalist, and in fact has written a book on this topic of entrepreneurship and teaches. And we have uh, Mark, who's uh, the partner at uh, Sidley, Austin, as well as Stan. Uh, so two very experienced partners in premier law firms uh, who are really experts in that topic, and we're going to try to get as much out of them uh, to demystify that topic a little bit. And, and please do send in the question, and I'll try my best to, to answer or to, to at least ask all the questions. So let me ask one to start to kick things off, um, which I'm sure is in the minds of many entrepreneurs, but perhaps people will be hesitant to ask that, look, you know, we're entrepreneurs, we're technologists, we're trying to come up with innovative technologies and develop new products and services and all that. And this topic, little topic of cap tables, you know, it's not important enough for me. I, I am, I'm, you know, I'm off to doing you know, other bigger things, more important things. So why should I even bother about that question? So I'm going to throw that out to the panelists to, to at least, you know, tell the audience why should they even care about it? Yeah. So I want to uh, put this in a, even uh, a context that you might not even have thought of, which is in a lot of ways you actually have a cap table before you even have a company. And I want to make that point because I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs in an early stage company accelerator for years and seen this happen several times, which is you get together with you know, people you know, acquaintances, uh, coworkers, others that you've decided to start a new company with. And you start down the road of doing the work to begin this company. You haven't even incorporated yet, but you're already putting work into this idea that you have together that you're going to build. And you haven't had that hard discussion about Who's going to own what out of the company? What are your roles and what's the share of each? And I've had the situation where the companies blow up before they even start because they come to me, they sit down, I want to start a company, and I say, okay, what, what is your cap table going to look like? And they look at me and I say, okay, who's got what ownership? And then they look at each other and they say, well, we'll get back to you. And two weeks later, I get a call. Uh, we couldn't come to a decision. We had a big fight about it and we've decided not to do this. Okay, so you have to think about that up front. You've got to decide that, and it, makes, it drives the decision. It makes the company uh, a lot safer 
going forward to know what your roles are. And then the second thing I'm going to say before you go to your next question is that you also have to decide up front what the vesting schedule is going to be for the founders. If it's a single founder, it doesn't matter. You can take all the stock and then negotiate later with your VC or whoever your investors are about how much of it they want to take back from you to ensure you're staying on, right? But if you're with co-founders and you're all going to contribute something to the company and you're all important to the company, the last thing you want when you're going out for investment or at any time is for you to have given out all your stock to the founders and then have one of them decide they'd rather be teaching surfing in Maui and take off with a third of your company. So the second thing is to think about how do you want to create the incentives among the founders to work together to build the company. Anyone else want to add on? Yeah, I mean, j j l l let's even demystify the cap table. What is a cap table? It's a simple spreadsheet which defines who owns what. So smart thinking is when you start the company, you have some decision among the founders, how is the uh, stock is to be allocated, and then you set aside a pool for future employees and advisors. Now, if this conversation that who owns what and how should we set aside is taking longer than two hours, a red flag should go up in your, in your mind. Because this is, should not be a complicated conversation among founders. And thing which I always tell people is that most of the stock allocation among founders is not about what you have done in the past. About 80% of the stock allocated to a founder is based on what you're going to do in the future. So two people come together, one person, you know, PhD, whatever, he brought, brings in a patent, the other guy is a business guy, he's a CEO, I mean, he's going to be the CEO, but the guy who's got a PhD also teaching at university is going to spend part-time, maybe on the weekends, so 20% of the allocation could be what they brought to the party, 80% what role they're going to play going forward. So that should define how the stock should be allocated among founders. More to come, but let me stop at this snippet. <clears throat> so Stan, you know, without going into too many of the legal details, maybe just, you know, boil down to what are the different types of ownership? What is common stock? What is preferred stock? There are a lot of other things that obviously come into the cap tables, but, but just a very high level so we can level set with the entrepreneurs in the room as to what are the different instruments that we're talking about? Uh, sure. This is on great. Um, yeah, so just to re recap what we just heard, to start at the most fundamental level, because as uh, Aptab said, this is, is maybe not sexy, but it's important, the cap table. And if I think of it as a basic pie chart, you've got the founder's uh, slice, which is the, majority, the, the vast majority, um, as Ian was saying, and then you've got a pool. That's kind of where we start. And then you think about a third chunk when you go and sell to investors. Uh, but starting with the first two, um, you've got the, the founders who get common stock. And the typical vesting in the Valley is, as you all know, the vast, vast majority of the time is four years with a one-year cliff for employees. There's a little more flexibility with founders. So that's an important decision, as Mark alluded to up front, about the vesting. Uh, it's point one. Point two is you, you own the company as founders, and you can decide that later. Or Now, my own view is that you're better off deciding it up front and putting something in place, even if it's a little bit aggressive, than punting to the time you have investors. Because if they want to invest, they may push back on certain items, but they are unlikely to tear up the whole thing. If you don't put it in place up front, you're likely to start the discussion de novo. And in my opinion, it starts at, you know, sort of vesting on, on the fuller side. So that's sort of the founder's piece. On the employee piece, it's important to have that in the, in the pool so that you can have those consultants and advisors and employees um, who are getting stock subject to vesting, and also if they leave, it goes back in the pool and you recycle that equity. Uh, and then third, and I think part of the question is, uh, and that's all common stock. When you raise money, typically you raise it through a preferred stock, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the investors do want certain uh, additional rights, although frankly many of those could be done by contract. The, the biggest reason for preferred stock is you would not typically sell common stock to raise money. Uh, if you did, you would essentially be setting a price for the common stock, uh, which is much higher than you intend. You want to keep the common stock essentially for what we often refer to as sweat equity, sell preferred stock to investors, negotiate those terms, typically at a much higher price than you're issuing options and common stock to, to founders for. So those are kind of the basic elements. I know we have more questions, so I'll stop there. So, you know, we, we've talked about and the founders talk, um, also many people refer to those as app shares. 
that has come up a few times. So maybe if we drill a little bit onto that, because obviously there are a number of entrepreneurs you know, in the previous session day, when the question was asked at how many entrepreneurs, about three quarters of people raised their hand. So I'm sure that question is lingering in their mind that what are those F shares, founder shares, what are some of the pros and cons <laughs> having those types of classification in the cap table, especially when you go out and negotiating with VCs? or other investors. Yeah, so let's, the interesting thing that I've seen in the last few years is there's been a real divergence in, in how these things are dealt with. Uh, and part of it is driven by the fact that this is a really hot market. And there are companies that are, you know, are ones that all sorts of investors want to pile into, right? So if you're Uber you, and you're starting out and you've got this great team, incredible, incredible technology and people are piling in knowing that they really want to invest in you and they're fighting over it practically. I mean, every round has been oversubscribed. The founders have had the ability to set aside class F shares for themselves or a, a special class essentially that gives them rights that you wouldn't normally get if you're kind of going to a, an investor hat in hand saying, please invest in me as opposed to we want to invest in you, right? And, uh, and what that gives them oftentimes is a supermajority voting ability so that the founders can keep control of the company for a longer period of time than would be typical for a startup. And the second thing is it may also, when it comes to preferences, and to take kind of a step further from, from what Stan was talking about, is investors are going to want to get paid back first, right? They're putting the risk capital up. And so they get preference shares. And the key thing about those preference shares is when there is a liquidation event of the company, the company gets sold or, you know, whatever, their money comes back to them first before any of the common shareholders get their money. Now, the founders can set up this special class that after the investors get paid, that maybe there's something that goes to the founders first before it goes to the common generally. Um, there are some reasons that that's attractive, obviously, for the founders. There may be some cultural issues within the company where, why the founders might want to stay with the common shareholders when it comes to that distribution. But that's really what that's all about, and it's frankly all about leverage, right? Are you going to the VC to basically sell your case on why they should invest in you, and there's maybe one or two VCs that are interested, and you're crossing your fingers and hopeful? Forget about Class F. You're going to have a really hard time negotiating that, right? But if you're, you know, the Ubers or Googles or others of the world where people want to pile in and be there and you're fighting off investors practically, then you can drive that decision. Well, let, me, let me just uh, demystify some of these terms because many entrepreneurs may not be as familiar. So when you sell shares in your company, they come in two flavors, common and preferred. Common is what most founders start with. You get common shares. Preferred is people who put actual money, they get preferred shares. What's the difference? It gives them protection when things don't go well. So if companies sold at a low value, the investor get to take the money off the table first. So this is basically, and allows you, this is not a bad thing to, you should always be selling preferred to investors because you don't want to mess up the price of your stock option. Because if you're selling to investors at 50 cents a share, you can still make an argument that your option price will be significantly less than that. 5x less, 7x less, used to be 10x less. So this is why you can give cheap options to employees to attract. So it's very important to sell preferred. Don't ever sell common shares to investors. So in the early stage of the game, you, you do use something called convertible note. It's a loan which will convert into preferred shares someday when you raise money. So there's some distinction. The concept which we are introduced right now is the F shares. F is in frank. And these are in between the common and the preferred, which gives a little bit more control. Only thing you need to remember is, if you're hot and you're famous, you can negotiate F shares. If you're normal, get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So, uh, you know, obviously, when, when we started the discussion, I made the comment that there's a lot of discussion as to what is that VCs look for and, you know, how to approach them. But, you know, point comes where some VCs, some investors are interested. Yeah, I want to hear the story, I want to, you know, work with you. Which brings us to the question that I would like to start with name, but uh, Stan, I would like to get your views as well, is what are the things that, from an entrepreneur standpoint, in negotiating that term sheet, and yes, there will be differences, whether you're Uber or, or another hard company, or it is something that the proof of concept or other things are not in place yet. So how would you approach that term sheet from the entrepreneur standpoint and stand, you know, once name is done from an 
entrepreneur standpoint, corporation, corporate governance, legal perspective, what are two or three key things that entrepreneurs should keep in mind when they are approaching investors? Name, why, why don't you start with that? So let's even start, what is a term sheet? So once you have done the whole dance and you and investor have fallen in love, they give you a non-binding document, which is the terms under which they're willing to invest some money. It's a two to eight page document which lists out the terms. And that's a big deal because it's not easy to get one of those. So the most, by the way, in the whole fundraising process, what is the moment which is the most joyous for an entrepreneur? This is when you get the email with the term sheet attached and before you open the email. <laughs> so, I highly recommend. So I have learned, by the way, now when I get that email, I usually walk around the block and do a high five. Because once you open it, you say like, what? Like, this? And you're really pissed off. So there's like 18 or 20 terms. First thing you want to do is call your lawyer, say, help me decipher this. But just to simplify you guys, all the things in term sheet fall into four buckets. The four buckets being valuation, economics, like who gets what, what is the company worth, liquidation preference, control, board seats, things like that. Third would be other uh, special rights, like information rights, veto rights, whatnot. And this is where you're going to talk to your investor. The one you should care the most about is the fourth bucket called Founders Treatment. It may not be spelled out though so clearly, but trust me, you wanna read that one. Because this is when you're gonna spell out and agree what happens if you get fired. If you get fired for what reason? With a cause or without cause? Do you accelerate your shares? What's the definition of cause? Just because you did something bad? So you wanna negotiate that. So my, when I negotiate the cause, definition of cause, it could be, if it's sometimes they say felony, okay, that's a legal term, but I always say, except for driving related, <laughs> could happen. Then you want to negotiate that, is it, is it just like a negligence? Is it gross negligence? Or is it willful gross negligence? Of course, I like to negotiate persistent willful gross negligence. <laughs> so you want to define that term. Also, you want to talk about constructive termination. What if they don't fire you, but they move you to Alaska? Your board can do that. <laughs> and then you want to see if company gets acquired, what happens to the founders? Do they get acceleration investing? Do they get severance? All those things, because everybody's euphoric, tend not to discuss. This is the time to discuss. I'll tell you more about it, but I'm a yield to my <laughs> gentleman from Tennessee. <laughs> I don't have the right accent, but I'll try. Um, so real quick, just a couple things. First, to pick on, up on what Naeem said, it does often get overlooked, the founders part. What I usually like to do, um, one thing we haven't said yet, almost um, invariably, when you sign a term sheet, you'll also sign uh, an exclusivity arrangement for a period of usually 30 to 45 days with that investor group. So that precludes you from going out and it, your leverage really drops to negotiate with others. Uh, ideally, you'd have a couple of term sheets and you're negotiating them before you sign, but that's Point one. So as a result, I like to get the founders vesting if you have some more aggressive terms in the term sheet, um, as Aim was saying, so that you're in a much better position to negotiate those as opposed to signing, you're now in a lockup and now you're, you're in a different position. Uh, second, we could talk uh, more time than we have about some of the important terms of the term sheet, but one that's a little bit legal that, that is hard to overstate how important it is in these early rounds when you're investing uh, is a liquidation preference. And, and the reason I flag that is it was noted earlier I think Naeem and Mark, about how you get paid back first in an acquisition. And that's, if that's all it is and the upside is uncommon, that's called the non-participating preferred. And that's absolutely what you'd like to negotiate. Um, the other bookend is a fully participating preferred, which is basically the investors always get paid back first. And thereafter, they uh, participate with the common on as converted basis. It might sound like a bunch of legal stuff. It doesn't matter. Maybe the first round is a couple of million dollars only. Um, and so getting that off first isn't a huge deal. However, it sets the tone for all of the subsequent financings to come. And it's extremely rare for a later financing uh, entity to not start with the last round and uh, have either parity or better terms. So we always try to negotiate in these seed rounds or series A preferred rounds to have a non-participating preferred on the theory that the economics of the A is on the upside of common. If you, if you layer in a liquidating uh, preference, um, fully participating preference, then 
For example, over time, I've had companies that have raised $100 million and then got sold for, let's say, $300. Um, in one case, there was non-participating preferred and the employees and everyone shared in a $300 million exit. In another case, they shared in a $200 million exit because it was participating preferred and it started and it continued. So um, I'll just plant that seed as one of the key terms. There are a number of others like governance that were mentioned. Okay. Uh, let me make yeah. sure you caught this. This is too important. See, this is lawyer speak. You can get to miss the key point. <laughs> preferred shares comes in two flavors. That was my Tennessee accent, perhaps. <laughs> preferred shares comes in two, two, two flavors, participating preferred and non-participating. Participating sounds like a good thing. Yeah, kumbaya, we want to participate. No. <laughs> what it means is that when companies sold, if the comp suppose VC put in 10 million, and suppose they had 2x participating preferred as a term. Company sells for 25 million. You're beginning to look at Teslas, you own 40%, you know, you think life is good. No, because they had participating preferred, what will happen is, first they'll get two times what they put in first. They put in 10 million, they take 20 million off the table. Now there's a 5 million left. Now they come back to the table and double dip and take their percent ownership of the remaining five. This is terrible. And once you get a participating preferred, every subsequent round would want the same thing. You're screwed permanently. <laughs> Your only option is to have a $500 million exit when it doesn't apply. For when it's a low exit, is, is a liquidation preference eat you up. Of course, we are optimistic. We think we can have a $500 million exit, so who cares? Don't. Statistics tell you, you got to protect yourself on the downside. Well, you know, I'm glad that in the beginning I said we will like to demystify, and good to see that the very, very straight language is being spoken to demystify some of that. I'm going to try to hit some of the questions uh, that we have not asked up until now. Great questions coming from the audience. Maybe quick responses. I will try to uh, combine a couple of those, given that we, we don't have a lot of time. What is the typical spread between common and preferred? You know, is there a rule of thumb that how many shares we should you know, start off with when you're approaching the investors? Um, so what the yeah. option pool look like? So maybe quick. Yeah, so there, this, I mean, there's so many permutations of this, but if you're going to ask me kind of what is the most cookie cutter structure I see, it's going to be 10 million shares at founding, it's going to be 80% uh, going among the founders, and 20% or 15 to 20% going to the, to the uh, stock option pool. Mm -hmm. And the issue is going to be you don't necessarily want to set aside anything to the investors yet because you don't know how much of the company you're going to end up negotiating with them for, and you don't want to pre-predict that. Okay. So, you know, if you look at the statistics in Silicon Valley, the typical Series A round is looking at about 25% post, you know, after the deal is done, ownership by the investors. You know, if you're a hot company, maybe you can do better than that. If you're a company that's, you know, struggling, it, they may end up having more ownership after that first round. Okay. Uh, what happens if you see a term sheet and the valuation and name your comment that you look and say, what, what is that? What do you do in that situation? Uh, where you have such a fundamental disconnect between how investors are valuing you and what, what you think. Any, anyone? Yeah, what's the, oh, go ahead. Get another term sheet. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, what's the difference between negotiation and begging? Answer is leverage. So you want a two-horse race or a three-horse race, that's the only time you, uh, you can negotiate. Otherwise, your only option is to walk away, which is seldom the option. So you got to make sure when, you, when you're doing this whole dance with investors, you try to line up two or three investors which can land at the same time. You got to do all the tricks in the books to make sure they land at the same time. Because, you know, once, once you sign a term sheet, you can't shop. When you put a ring on her, your, your activities have to change dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you'll pay a heavy price. <laughs> You know, perhaps the answer to that question would be obvious, but the question has been asked that how important it is to document all the promises that you make, entrepreneurs may make along the way to employees, consultants, business advisors, and the list goes on and on, and what's the best way to, to do that? Yeah, that goes back to my first comment when we started this. <laughs> you have got to get these things down because the fastest way to blow up a company is not to have those... Uh, decisions made and written down as to who gets what, on what schedule, and what amount, for what money. Otherwise, y y you know, you risk the company. Okay. 
Well, th there, are, there are so many other questions, but I, I want to ask one that I think it's important because eventually that does have a huge impact, and perhaps people in the beginning don't think uh, hard about that, is to, there is a commonly known term, 83B election, and that has to do with the taxes. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, at least, you know, both Stan and, and, and Mark, from both of you, uh, your perspective, what are the, you know, two or three top things that, from a pros and cons perspective, that election um, entrepreneurs should keep in mind? Not just the entrepreneurs, but I think the early employees as well. Um, you know, what is that 83B election and what does that do for it? Stan, maybe you wanna? Uh, just real quick, yeah, there's not a lot of pros and cons. Um, essentially, the tax code says that if you're subject to substantial risk of loss, here I get the boring uh, legal stuff again, <laughs> I, but um, they, they'll only tax you when invest, but the problem is with the typical founder stock, you don't wanna be taxed in a year or two or three as a vest because then there's a real spread in the value and upfront, the fair market value, quote unquote, is extremely nominal typically. So um, the election is saying, I don't wanna be taxed when I vest, I wanna be taxed now but you're not really taxed because typically there's no spread. So you get a founder stock at a tenth of a cent or even a hundredth of a cent or whatever. Um, you file this election and it has to be filed within 30 days of the grant of the purchase. Um, and then you've elected out of that alternative treatment, which can be very, uh, very draconian. And there's some other things like early exercise. I don't know if Mark wants to comment as well. Okay, that's good. Okay, okay let, 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 let me decipher this. <laughs> My translator again. <laughs> there almost everything lawyers can solve for you. There's one thing they cannot solve. If you forgot to file Form 83B within 30 days of purchasing your founder shares, subject to vesting. So when you buy the founder share, they should be subject to vesting because you don't want one founder to fall in love with some girl and run away to Brazil six months later, still owns 50% of the company. You, vesting is important to make sure they're here for four years working hard before they own the shares. So you should be subject to vesting. If you don't make it, your investors will make you. It's just start with vesting. Now, what's the deal? If you don't file for Form 83B and your founder is subject to vesting, what does the IRS think? IRS thinks every month you spe you're investing 10,000 shares, which were got at like 10th of a penny, now they're worth like a dollar a share. You are getting ordinary income of $10,000 per month, and you have to pay tax on that. And you know you can't, you don't have money, it's just paper money, but no, you have to pay tax every month as you're investing. That's bad news. You avoid that by simply filing one form. And that's the only thing which I file when I have returned receipt requested. You don't save money in the post office. You want proof. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so last question before we leave the stage. One or two words, what is the uh, one error that you have seen that uh, many, invest uh, many entrepreneurs make when they approach the VCs for funding that perhaps is very easy to, to avoid, if there is one? A common, common mistake that you have seen. Boy, where do you start? I think it's more on the business side in a way than it is on the yeah. cap table side. Fair enough. Right, and it's you know, really more a question about uh, knowing where you're going as a company and having a very clear focus and, uh, and a tight, decided, determined team in terms of how you're sharing the, uh, the uh, responsibilities of the company. And, um, and that to me is the most important thing. Okay. I think tying in the discussion with that and blending what uh, you know, Mark and Amy said is the, the error is essentially airing, having your dirty laundry not, not cleaned up before you go. So to tie to this discussion, you got your cap table, work out these issues with your co-founders. Huge red flags, obviously, if you go and you, you have invested. People are excited about investing. However, it's clear that there's some dissension or things aren't quite right or you haven't quite settled because nothing kind of concerns investors like... Uh, the, the idea of going in and then having the company blow up because of these issues. But I think the point which was mentioned earlier, let me repeat that point, which is, after you sign the term sheet, by the way, this is not time to celebrate yet. Because now start the legal due diligence. And 20% of the deals fall through during the legal due diligence. What is the cause? That's the question Aftab is asking. Which is you have messed up cap table, and have promises made to people and other employees and we'll, you'll, you'll get, is, this company is yours. We just like all together, yeah, yeah, you have 20%. Those verbal agreement are contracts. 
You have to make sure that you have proper assignment of intellectual property to the company. Anybody wrote some code, your friend, somebody, you need to have make sure you have given some consideration and own the intellectual property. Everybody who wrote code should be assigned to the company. Any patent right should be assigned to the company. You have not given loose promises to people who owns what. If you make those mistakes, they'll come back to bite you at the founding and see the app. This happened with Apple computers. Look at the Steve Jobs book. Promises were made. This happened in the Facebook movie. You saw the movie. So those are the things to be avoided in the, on, uh, in the beginning. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave the um, audience with the thought we've all heard. No pain, no gain. And we have a choice to make that either we can suffer the pain of discipline or suffer the pain of disappointment and mess at the, at the end of the day. With that, um, please join me in thanking our panelists. To demystify that topic, we're going to be hanging around. So if there are any questions, we can be asked. Why?